and I was 19, 20. Norm was 17. Olivia was 16. So within three months, we're huge names. Marcy Jones, welcome to the Australian Music Vault. How exciting. <laughs> so Marcy, um, tell us how you started your music career. Well, first of all, I studied as a classical singer. So from nine years old, I played piano. Then when I turned 12, I started to learn uh, classical singing. And of course, the singing was always so much easier than the piano because I had to work at the piano. But the singing was came naturally. I started off very, very young when my grandparents, uh, Minnie and Joe, would have everybody around at their place in Brunswick and they'd play the spoons and the banjo and the piano and the saxophone and they'd sit me up on the dining room table at two and I'd sing along, you know, amongst the lamingtons and the sausage rolls. <laughs> so I would sing along and my Uncle Jack at a little tiny country place in Victoria called Blackwood, a little hall in there, they'd have, my cousins would all be playing and because we're all, you're all related in little country towns and, um, and he would call me up and he'd say, come sing with me, Sia. And I'd go up and I'd sing with him. So that was probably the first time I ever worked on a stage. I went there the other day actually um, for, a, for a relative's funeral and I looked at the stage and I thought, gosh, nothing's really changed, you know. And uh, so that's probably the beginning. And then after I, I trained as a classical singer and I was learning classical piano, at 15, 15 and a half, I used to go to the dances with my girlfriends and uh, my dad would take us all in his little green brickies truck, take the stuff out the back, you know, the cement mixer and everything, and we'd all get in the back and we would go to Canterbury Ballroom. So we used to go down there on a Saturday night and the boyfriends and everything else would go and anyway this particular night the boyfriends weren't there and my girlfriends went up to uh, Malcolm Arthur was the singer with the Melbourne Thunderbirds and said you know our girlfriend sings can she sing and of course they always say no but we're auditioning on Saturday so if she wants to come along so I did and I got the job so that was the beginning so they also worked for Ivan Damon uh, who ran a lot of the dances in um, in Melbourne, and uh, he had dances um, uh, Preston Circle, uh, Canterbury Ballroom, uh, Sunshine Rock. I, was Glen Iris? I don't think Glen Iris Rock was one of his, but and Preston Town Hall was someone else's. But that's the way I started. So for about eighteen months, I sang with the Thunderbirds, sixty forty dance. Ivan Damon moved me to another dance he had, which was Preston Circle which was another old picture theatre that they turned into a dance, okay. So there I worked with the Raiders, which were fantastic, really well-known rock and roll band around the time, Johnny Lyle and the Raiders. And uh, then I started to work with a band that didn't have a name and a young singer, a bit younger than me, with very long hair, which was Normie Rowe. So... Then I became the female singer for the Playboys and Normie Rowe became the male singer for the Playboys. Dennis Smith and Julian Jova started looking for artists from around all the dancers to appear on a brand new teenage television program which, uh, which was, went up against Bandstand in Sydney. So this was done out at ATVO. Um, Channel O in those days out at Nulla Wadding and it became the Go Show. Now that was taken from an English program called uh, Ready Steady Go which Dusty Springfield I think used to compare and all, all the, the, the local artists would go on which was the same here. So I became an integral part of the uh, cast along with Nomi Rowe and Johnny Young and Livy Newton-John, Pat Carroll and Joy Lemon and Bobby and Laurie and The Strangers and 
heaps and heaps. Oh, Peter Doyle. Oh, gosh, so many others. So we sang, we sang, unless you had your own record out, you sang the hit parade. So I was always the, the opener or the closer because I was one of these, you know, get in and whoa, 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 which I didn't sort of sit on a chair and go, you know, like this. So I was always the opener or the closer. So I did... Um, anything new from um, um, oh, all the rock and roll singers? Gosh, I've gone totally River Deep, Mountain High, Tina Turner, um, and all of those sort of people. Um, it was great. It was great, and I loved it. And I loved the kids because the audience were all. It was live, and they were all young kids. And but we had to mime because they really didn't do things live in those days. So we would we would record it live and then we'd have to mime because I never sang the same thing the same twice. So you know, I did a lot of <laughs> coming back into camera and getting it and getting it right. Mm. I mean, we all started out through, I think Pat started um, doing stuff on Channel 9 because she was a singer-dancer. I think Olivia had gone in some competition. Um, we all, most of us came from the dancers. Within three months of being on, on the Go Show, which went all over Australia, it was national. So we were household names. So there you'd see me maybe talking about... Uh, milk commercials, a cereal with my name on the back and my face. <laughs> breakfast with me. Fan tales. And I was 19, 20. Norm was 17. Olivia was 16. So within three months we're huge names and we're starting to record. Uh, the boys had the hit records because the girls bought the records, you know, the 45 records. So all the girls mainly bought records, but they would buy the girl stuff. But I became Normie Rowe's girlfriend. So I was the most hated girl in the whole of Australia. They either loved me or they hated me, right? And because I was very much the girl next door, I wasn't you. I wasn't perfectly slim. I wasn't didn't have perfect teeth. I wasn't perfect in any way. I was really that freckly girl from next door who was somebody's brother or sister. So um, I wasn't a bit posh, but you know. So the girls who really liked me really really liked me, but the ones who loved Normie, oh, they hated me. When I started to tour, they would throw eggs at me and tomatoes. And I have a very warped sense of humour. <laughs> so we'd be working. I remember this one particular day I had on blue organza dress, my pretty new blue organza dress, because we were very mod. So, you know, they were cute little shoes and it was very mod. And um, I copped this tomato right here. And I, by this stage, I'd been ducking eggs and ducking fantails and all hitting the back of Trotter's drums, which was Normie's uh, and still is Norm's drummer. It's been with him forever. And they'd be hitting, the, hit, and we'd all be laughing, you see, because it was a bit of a huge joke. Then I got this tomato right on the pale blue organza. Well, that was it. I scraped it off with my hands. I walked to the front of the stage. I saw who did it. Pow! And she copped it. And I said, now we can keep on doing this all night if you like because I'm having really great fun now. Then you'll never get to see Normie Rowe because I'm not getting off till I'm finished. They all shut up. All of a sudden they were all quiet. I just got on with my show. I had to do that. But anyway, that's what taught me to be tough in this business. So thank you to all those miserable little girls out there, <laughs> 13 and 14. And a lot of them love me today, but there'll be a few that still hate me. They'll see this and they'll go, yeah, we still hate her. Thank you so much because you made me strong. But the girls, we, we had a tough road. For all the girls out there today, I went to Olivia's gala night the other night and it was lovely to catch up with her. We're very old friends. <clears throat> and uh, Dummy Inn was on, Dummy Inn. And I went up to her and I said, you are absolutely wonderful. And Delta, 
nice girl, so patient with all the people. And, and it's fantastic for them. But I know exactly where they're coming from. But today, everybody loves them. The boys and the girls all love them because if they can sing and they can go out there and entertain, then everybody loves them for what they do. <clears throat> but in my day, it was a lot harder. We had to work twice as hard as any of the guys. And that's why probably I'm still working today. Uh, I've just turned 72. So that's why I'm still working today and um, going out, I'm getting the audiences that are my age group that are coming, you know, in their 60s, just turning 70s. But I'm getting people coming in their 30s, 40s and 50s. They're going, oh, my God, she can sing. Yeah, look me up on YouTube. Thank God for Wikipedia and YouTube because then they can go back and see exactly what you do. You don't expect them to know. But I feel it's a shame because of the Australian history that people actually don't go in and check it out because we were the pioneers. We were the second lot in. Johnny O'Keefe and his lot, Bandstand, um, Little Paddy, and uh, they were the first lot in. And then there was us. And, boy, I tell you what, everybody started on the Go Show. Everybody came in. For, um, um, ACDC, the Zoot, well, they weren't ACDC in those days, but all Max Merritt and, and um, all these amazing people from New Zealand who came over here, Dinah, and just everybody appeared on the Go Show. And we're still working today and the people who come to see us they love it. They don't care. You know, if I've lost a few pounds, I say, what do you reckon? They all cheer. And if I put it back on again, they all cheer. They don't care because they've grown up with us and we are, we are their youth. In um, <clears throat> 1967, I was, we were still doing the Go Show. The Go Show hadn't finished. Um, and I was doing lots of other television shows as well, like Bandstand, Saturday Date. There were other things on Saturday mornings. Oh, I can't remember. Rock and Roll Circus. It was a heap of shows, television shows. I probably did every television show there was to do in that time over and over again. Oh, um, Don Lane's Tonight Show from Sydney, Graham Kennedy. Worked with Graham Kennedy a lot. Funny man, very funny man. Just lovely. He used to call us uh, Dora and the Drop Scones, Sheila and the Shortbreads, Lorna and the Lamingtons. He always had a name for Marcy and the Cookies whenever we went on the show. But um, I was going up to work in Queensland and the cookies all come from Brisbane. They were from Portsmouth but they, they lived in Queensland, in Brisbane, just out of Brisbane. And, of course, it was a huge scene in Brisbane, at the, you know, Lobby Lloyd and the Coloured Balls. Um, so many amazing uh, groups came out of Brisbane, came out of Mike Ferber, so many amazing. Anyway, so I used to go up there and work a lot. So there was Cloudland Ballroom which was run by Ivan Damon and because I was part of his um, group, uh, I'd go there, I'd do uh, Brisbane Countdown and then I'd, I'd do a couple of other clubs like the uh, Purple, what was it called, the Purple Prawn <laughs> and a couple of others. Anyway, and I would always do um, Cloudland Ballroom. So the, they had a big band there and I used to work with the big band. So the Cookies did vocal backing on... Um, a Brisbane countdown for everyone. So I went up there to do, um, I did an Aretha Franklin song called uh, Respect and they didn't know it was suck it to me and they're singing suck it to me. <laughs> suck it to me, suck it to me, suck it to me. Instead of suck it to me. <laughs> and we didn't realise that till a lot later. But I met the girls, got on really well with them. I'm four years older than Margaret who's the eldest of the cookies. Then they go down in 15 months so then there's Wendy and then there's Beverly. So Beverly was like 15, I think, and I was 22, I think. So um, I, we did some shows together and I said, oh, look, I've got a few shows down in Surface. Then I've got a group of, uh, of uh, shows down in uh, Sydney. How about you do them with me? And Ivan had sent Norm a thousand miles away from me and me a thousand miles away from Norm so that we wouldn't see each other, so that the whole thing with... Oh, yeah, they did that in those days. And Oh, Ivan David got someone to take my letters and all. When Norm was in, in, um, in, in England, when he first went over 
to try and make it over there. He called it It's Not Easy and a few other things. Um, David Joseph was looking after everyone at that time and I even told David to take my letters. And I only found out when Norm really cracked it. He thought I hadn't written to him for weeks. And uh, Trotter, the drummer, he told me what was going on. Oh, because I wasn't good for his image. Um, he shouldn't have a girlfriend. Um, all the girls that love Norm think they've got a chance with him. And uh, it was bad for his image. So that's what they did. So I met the girls and I said, how about we do some shows together? And, and I said to Norm, what do you think? He said, fantastic. But you see, it, it didn't really stop us because if he was working in Sydney, he'd get in the car and, and drive 500 miles up to where I was. So he'd come and join me. In the end, Ivan gave up. And, and left and left it alone. <laughs> but the girls and I got together and we got on our sewing machine and we could all sew, so we whipped up some costumes to go down to Surfers Paradise, worked out what we could sing, uh, what songs of they, what songs of, of mine that I had charts for. Um, and Marcy and the Cookies started up. That was 1967. We went in Hoadley's Battle of the Sounds with the groove and a whole lot of other people and we, we came second. They didn't know what to do with us because we were a female vocal group. They called us a band. I said, no, we're not a band. We don't play instruments. We're a vocal group. We're a good vocal group because I'm a very strong <coughs> singer and the girls had this amazing harmony being all sisters and the whole thing just went shoo. It just... And even today, if we if the girls were here in this room and we decided to sing something for you, we'd just slip into it and you'd go, whoa, we weren't fancy Nancy. We didn't sing, uh, um, I think we might have put a couple of um, Supreme songs in, but they weren't funky enough for us. We liked um, um, Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells and um, the groups, the black groups that worked with Presley and some of these, but the Sweet Inspirations and, and, and these groups, not lollipop music. We wanted really good funky music. We listened to all the, the Motown groups, all the black groups coming out of America. I mean, they were just... No one sings like them. We buy records. Um, if we didn't hear what was on the radio, being in the business, people would say, "Have a listen to this. Have a listen to that." When Norm was in England, he'd sent me he'd send me home albums of Patti LaBelle and the Sweet Inspirations, and and say, well, "You girls should do this song. Have a listen to this." So, um, and that was the kind of stuff that we liked to do anyway. It's a shame in those days that we didn't have somebody who could write for us because that would have been great. So the songs that we recorded were songs that other people had, had written or other people had recorded because coming out of um, um, England in particular, they had... Um, uh, they were stopping playing uh, English material. We had a ban on stuff. And so a lot of the new records and albums and 45s that were coming into the country, we could actually take our pick and, and get hits with those songs here because we weren't playing the original. And Stan Rofe helped a lot with that sort of thing back in that time. In 1968, we were booked to, do, to tour with the Monkees. So we toured all over Australia with the monkeys, which was brilliant. They were such nice boys and we were young. And Beverly, at one stage we were staying at the Siebel Townhouse in Sydney and Beverly decided she would go and get something up the street or whatever, like she's 16. They wouldn't let her back in. She couldn't get, get back in. Oh, but I'm, I'm on the show. Oh, yeah, right, sure you are. <laughs> she had to actually get the doorman to ring up and say, it's Beverly from the cookies here. And we said, oh, my God, let her in. But um, it was pretty exciting. The boys were great. All the boys were nice. Um, I got on really well with, um, I'm having a 72-year-old mental thingy, David, David Jones, was Davy Jones and Marcy Jones. I also sang with Tom Jones. So there were <laughs> all these Jones people. Um, but, no, the monkeys were great. After we worked with them and toured with them, we had a record out called I Would If I Could and thank heavens we, and I'm just trying to think who it is and I'm, 
I'm not really quite sure. I can, can't remember. But one of the DJs from Sydney, and of course they go out, out to the front and they say, you know, and ladies and gentlemen, while I was backstage, I just happened to say, hi, Peter, and then scream, scream, scream. Hi, Michael, screams. And then I said, Davy, and of course the whole place is erupting. But before the monkeys, we've got four girls from Melbourne. I could have killed him. I'm sta standing by the side of the stage thinking, I'll kill him. I will kill him. We could have gone out and died the worst death. See how stupid? They don't think because all of a sudden they've got the power of making all these girls scream. Too bad about you who were about to come on. Oh, I gave it to him when we came off. Boy, did he get a dressing down. So out we went and luckily for us we're four very ordinary girls and uh, we were dolly birds. Well, we were kind, kind of were, I guess, but we were four fairly ordinary girls. And, of course, we waved to all the girls and said hi and we're very friendly. So they all loved us. And then we sang I Would If I Could and the whole place sang I Would If I Could. And we killed them. We ended up, we killed them. And we could sing really bloody good. We had, we had a manager, uh, Gary Spry, who was um, part of a huge um, agency uh, called AMBO, Australian Management Booking Organisation. So I was being booked through them. And then when I brought the girls down to Melbourne, we were all getting booked through them. So Gary was our manager and that's when um, we decided what we were going to do from that period of time. Um, do we stay? Do we stay? And we'd been working, I suppose, in Melbourne not very long. So we made quite an impact <clears throat> in about 18 months before we went overseas, I was very well known. So, But bringing the girls back on board, it became very, very different because there were, there was the Cliff Moores from Adelaide, there was the Bradley sisters. I can't think who else there were. The Bradleys were two. Cliff Moores were four sisters. Um, but we, I think the difference was with us, it was the strong really funky lead vocal and these fantastic harmonies. And then we do a lot of four part as well, but it was really strong. So it was very, very different. Um, and then Gary decided uh, we'd go in Hoadley Battle of the Sounds, which the groove also went in, Pete Williams and the groove. So they won it. And we kind of came second. They didn't know really what to do with us. Anyway, we went overseas as well, but they went over on the ship. They won the the you know, the trip to England on the ship. And we um, we flew over. So what we did was we worked all through the Far East, um, Singapore, uh, Bangkok, Hong Kong, uh, the Philippines. It was a cabaret circuit. So they would book you into the hotels and you would be the main act for whatever night or whatever that was on. Um, so, but we had to buy five round-the-world air tickets, right, because you've got no money. So we start off by um, the first week we, we pay for one round-the-world air ticket, the second week we pay for another one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. So we were away for about eight weeks. So after paying for our five round-the-world air tickets, which I think at that stage were about $1,200, um, then we had to have money to live on in England. So, you know, um, the groove had gone ahead and they had um, a place where they were staying. So when we first went over, we stayed with them. It was one of those huge, big, long, tall, skinny in Sloan Square in Chelsea and, and, and we all had our bedrooms. Us, we all stayed together and the boys. And that was till the wives and girlfriends came over then they had to get another place. But we all, we all lived there. So we hadn't had to have enough money in order to live in England for a few months. You're starting all over again, basically. Uh, we had an agent. Uh, he booked us um, in our first job, which was... I always have a terrible mental... But it'll come to me. It was a very, very well-known big club over there. I'll think of it in a second. And he booked us in there and we thought, great, we're starting to work, fantastic. So we went on and we did our rehearsal with the band that was on. It was great, everything was good. 
Um, we went on that night and we absolutely killed them. We did a couple of really great encores. It, people were standing up. It was lovely. We were so relieved. So we go back to our digs and we stay the night. We're all very excited. The next morning our agent rings and he says, so Marcy, how did it go? So I'm telling him. He said, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, I had a phone call from the uh, manager of the club this morning to say you were so bad people were walking out and they've cancelled you. I was gobsmacked. I'm thinking, what? Because that's not what happened at all. But what happened was the manager of the club was getting off with the manager of the other girl group that was on. They were a regular on... I nearly had the name of the place. They were a regular every week. Their manager was getting off with the club's manager and didn't want us. These girls from Australia, they're too good. Don't want them on. So that's why, that's what happened. It was all political. So that's all right, okay, we got, we got away with that, put that away, started to work around the different clubs, um, Manchester, um, <clears throat> all the working men's clubs. I got to meet Georgie Best, had a little a little tater tate with George over a few months, which was lovely. Norman come home from Vietnam and gone out on the town and met someone else. So we broke it off. George was much, much later. But he helped, he helped mend the little heart a little bit. But going backwards, um, we had, um, we started to work and we were working around the clubs and it was good and we were doing really well. And then um, Cliff Richard, because he was um, Australian management uh, and knew us and knew Gary and asked us would we like to work with Cliff We'd do his support, so we did our own show first, then the girls would come on and sing vocal backing for Cliff. So we did, which was fantastic. Cliff was, his whole tour was booked and he was booked to go back to this club and work where we'd been paid off from. Karma, karma, karma. So when they said, yes, we'll do it, and uh, on our show we have Marcy and the Cookies. Well, that went down like a lead balloon. So once again, oh, no, we've appeared our ugly heads again, you know. Uh, so they didn't want us there. He didn't want us there, the manager and the, and the, and the manager of the girls that were working there. Well, um, they said, if uh, Marcy and the Cookies come, we won't have Cliff. And Cliff said, that's fine. That's just fine. Well, of course, they weren't going to go without having Cliff at their club. So then they come back and backtrack very, very quickly. Oh, yes, but well, we could do that. That would be all right if Marcy and the Cookies go on first and our girls go on before Cliff. And we said, that's fine. So the silly idiots, we went on first and really killed them they're on, they went on just before Cliff and then the girls all went on with Cliff. Silly, silly, silly. And we could have all got on really well and that needn't have happened. And I don't think they ever did anything, those particular girls. So there you go. We were earning money and, and we were travelling around e England but it was no different to what I was doing in Australia, you know, Travelling around Australia, working the clubs, working the dances, working everything. And I was getting, uh, at this stage now, I'll get back to Norm. Um, I'd been away. Norm had, um, was coming home from Vietnam. I wanted to come home because at that stage we were still engaged. And um, I was made to feel by management that if I left, uh, the girls wouldn't be able to work. So I was between this and that and I didn't know what to do. So in the end, I had, I had a breakdown. I lost my voice. I couldn't sing. So then I'm no good to nobody because I can't hold up my end. And that's when Gary said, look, if you want to go home, you can go home. So by this stage, Norm had been home. He'd met someone else. 
Not that he was going to marry her at that say, you know, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, but things change. Um, I was a mess. That, that, that stage was when uh, we went back for that last time to um, Ireland and I met George, uh, George Best, and um, we would got to know each other and he was, he was lovely and his family was lovely. So that happened then. But I, I just wanted to go home. I'd had enough. So I was told, yes, if you want to go home, you can go home. So I pack up, tell my parents I'm coming home. Olivia at that stage was um, living with Bruce Welsh from The Shadows. So Bruce and Livy came and picked me up and took me to the airport. And I got on the big bird and I came home. Of course, all the press were here at the other end and, well, tell us what happened with Normie and blah, blah, blah. Norm was supposed to come and meet me but um, he had people working against me from the other end. <laughs> There's always somebody interfering. And so he didn't, he didn't get out to see me. So um, it took a while for us to sit and have a chat. He, um, <laughs> I found out that, that um, he was getting married and um, that was kind of that. And Norm and I are great pals. Um, he's been through all my love affairs and I've <laughs> been there with him through all of his, and we, you know, we've both made mistakes. In the process of being home, um, I met the man I married. He worked for Ambo. He managed Russell Morris. I married Michael. I was 27. When I came home, I was 25, so I was 27. So I was getting a bit older, wanted to have kids. Uh, Norm was married. Um, he had his family. And I thought, well, I might as well, I might as well. Michael, I thought, was a good man. I thought he'd be honest and true. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, so I got married and I had my kids. But I divorced Michael a long time ago. I was working, doing all the clubs in Sydney, doing more television, um, do, just doing all that sort of thing. But basically, and I went in to do a, um, a, a theatre, a, a show, a musical, um, when I had Bo, um, because Bo was one pound nine, he was in hospital for three months. And on the day that I brought him home from hospital, my mother at 59 dropped dead with a massive stroke. So for two years, I didn't really, really couldn't get my head around doing anything. I just wanted to be at home, look after my children, which I did. Then I auditioned for this show. Then I thought, God, I hope I don't get it. What am I going to do if I get it? Um, which I did, but I just had someone come in and, and help me while, while I did this particular show. Um, uh, oh, my ex-husband and I uh, bought a uh, theatre restaurant, um, Alexander's Big Band Restaurant. Shirley Strawn was our partner. Um, they had a, we had a 10-piece orchestra. I sang with the band. So we did all the music from the 30s right through to the 80s. So I was busy. I was busy with children. And, um, and singing still. So I sang there. That all kept going until um, he was running around with one of the waitresses and then that all came to a big kablop finish. In the end, we lost everything. Everything went. Um, after that, I met my partner of today. Uh, we've been together for Murray Robinson. We've been together for, I don't know how long it is, seems like forever since about 91 or something. I'm still writing, I'm still recording. Um, a couple of years ago I brought out um, a single which people can go in and have a look at called Blackbird Bye Bye. Uh, we did the original arrangement of Bye Bye Blackbird which Murray found um, the way it was originally written in 1926. So we did that and it's fantastic because you actually tell you tell the story of it. It's not around the piano, have a few beers and has a sing-along. It's actually about a young black prostitute who leaves behind her old life, which are the blackbirds, and goes home to her mother, who is the bluebird. So that's what the song is about. It's a blues song. And that was played all around the world for the last couple of years on uh, internet radio, which is brilliant. I've got fans in Greenland and Argentina, <laughs> all over the place. Um, so that was fantastic. Uh, I've had 17 nominations in the Victorian Country Music Awards for my work and they're hard to get, to make top two each time. 
Uh, but I won in 2009 with, with a song I wrote called Daddy, which is about four generations of children whose fathers are, are going to war. But I pulled it out earlier this year and uh, I changed the name and I, I wrote another verse and I called it No Glory in War. I'm very excited about it because it's very different for me. And, um, you know, and, and it's for today. It's telling all those warmongers out there. There's no glory in war. <laughs> <laughs>